I'm Benjamin Hall, Fox News correspondent and New York Times bestselling author. Join me for my brand new podcast, Searching for Heroes. Make sure you subscribe to this series wherever you download podcasts and leave a rating and review. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right. New music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. My name is Jeremy Quintanilla. You are listening to Age of Jeremy. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm the co-founder of Age of Radio and 3T Fitness and well, other businesses that I am working on. This podcast is about everything that I learn and the trials and tribulations it took to learn them. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Age of Jeremy. Before we get started, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast. Also, make sure to follow me on Instagram at Age of Jeremy, where you can get some investment news from the leader in financial education, investments, accounting, taxes, and business advice. And if I'm not the leader yet, I will be soon. Also, follow our podcast network, The Age of Radioverse, on Instagram at Age of Radioverse. 100 podcasts strong and growing. You can also check me out on TikTok at Age of Jeremy and Twitter at Age of Jeremy Q. If you want to be on this podcast and chat, email me at jeremy.quintanilla at ageofradio.org. That's Jeremy, J-E-R-E-M-Y dot Quintanilla, Q-U-I-N-T-A-N-I-L-L-A at ageofradio.org. We are looking for small business owners and influencers to share their stories, no matter how small, no matter how big. We just love a good story. All right, let's talk about some stuff that you should know. GameStop released their earnings and they were less than spectacular and that the problem is is that GameStop necessarily in my opinion isn't that great of a company. So why meme stocks won't last is because speculation is just gambling. So you may get some right like I got some right with AMC not 100% sure. I've owned AMC for a while. Not 100% sure how long I will hold that but I'm holding it for right now. Never been a fan of GameStop but sometimes you can get a squeeze right you know just like with uh GameStop, I guess. But in the end, looters get found out. Now, that is one of my favorite lines. Looters get found out. Unfortunately, looters get found out is a line or a concept from the horrible book Atlas Shrugged by Anne Rand or Ayn Rand or however the heck she pronounces her name. So my apologies, Miss Rand, even though you're not with us anymore. I do encourage you to read this book if you haven't. If you want to know how to defend um, communism and, say, employee-owned businesses, then make sure to understand your competition. And Atlas Shrugged is probably at the head of that competition for the GOP or for conservatives in general. Anyway, a GameStop fell on Wednesday reporting a wider net loss than expected for the July quarter. The meme stock reported a $0.76 cent share loss with net sales of $1.8 billion. GameStop fell to $182.50 and after hours trading, I wrote this last night, so I'm not 100% sure where that's at right now, but you can go and check it out because hopefully you have a phone that has the internet. The analyst call also only added, at lasted eight minutes and really didn't allow for questions from analysts. The new CEO, Matt Furlong, introduced himself, thanked employees, and provided no outlook whatsoever. Now, most of their sales came from hardware, then pre-owned games, and then collectibles. The stock will probably rebound. However, GameStop itself has never impressed me. They have a lot of work to do. And if you're going to continue on into perpetuity, the one thing I think that will do, uh, actually, so the one thing that I think that they are doing right, um, if they can do it right, is the GameStop NFT or non-fungible tokens. If you aren't familiar with non-fungible tokens, it is something that I'm highly interested in and looking at writing a piece on for this podcast to um, present to all of you. So you can kind of get an idea what an NFT is, but that's right. GameStop is essentially starting its own NFT. Now, that being said, is GameStop a buy? Well, talk to your financial advisor and see what they think. I would like it to move. I would like I would like GameStop to move more into the software space um, or creating software, which is one of the reasons why I'm excited about the NFT platform. Like if you go to NFT stop NFT.gamestop. It has the ability to look and see what jobs they're looking for. They're looking for Python programmers. They're looking for um, blockchain uh, programmers or people that understand blockchain. And I think that moving in that direction could be good. But how else can they, I guess, 
utilize that software development in other functions because right now most of their money again comes from hardware and if there isn't a lot of new hardware coming out then that's not going to last forever pre-owned games may but there's a lot of new things that are happening in the streaming space with video games and then collectibles i think is a good place for them to be so they should really focus on that collectible space and seeing what they can do All right. One thing that I get excited about is international markets. And on Wednesday slash Thursday, Wednesday, U.S., Thursday, I believe, was when it happened in Asia. Asia falls as the Fed signals downshift in the economy. So making sure that you understand what's going on in international markets is super important for your investments for your, and for your investment strategy and to help diversify into some of the great companies that are across the ocean or in Asia, uh, Asian markets, especially one of my favorite companies of all time, um, Nintendo and Yamaha, which are on the Japanese stock market. Now, that being said, uh, Asian falls as the Fed signals downshift in the economy. Shares fell Thursday across Asia. Mainly, it's falling because of the increase in COVID-19 across the Asian countries. There's also a mounting supply chain problem and labor shortages that have been affecting Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and um, um, and uh, Sydney as well. So China has also placed strength and controls over business that thrived during the pandemic. So also, one of China's biggest real estate developers looks like it's going to default on its bank loans. So I know all of that sounded all gloom and doom, but I'm a big fan of Asian and Southeast Asian markets. I believe there's a lot of opportunity. You should have some international exposure in your portfolio. So make sure to talk to your financial advisor about how you can invest in Asia. Maybe just hold off until next year. Let's take a quick break. Get out of the trenches of tedious tasks like managing order fulfillment and start growing your business with ShipStation. They'll help increase profitability by automating your workflow with their simple, easy-to-use dashboard. With it, you can pretty much do everything you need to quickly and easily. Update order information, print labels, compare rates, optimize shipments, and even set up automatic delivery notifications. And it doesn't matter where you sell. Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, ShipStation can integrate pretty much anywhere online. Another great thing about ShipStation? They can help reduce costs with industry-leading discounted rates from some of the biggest mail carriers. You might even be able to get up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. So, make this year your most profitable one yet. Sign up for your free 30-day trial at ShipStation.com and use the code SPOTIFY. That's ShipStation.com with the code SPOTIFY. It's time to say goodbye to hold music. And say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away. All while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at salesforce.com slash products slash service. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about family over the past year. I've been spending in between time thinking about my family and how disconnected we are from each other as far as immediate family. By this mean by this I mean my grandparents and their offspring. We have fallen apart for a couple of reasons. So the number one reason we have fallen apart I feel is because of Christianity. There's a branch of our family that are Wesleyans and they don't associate with the rest of us all that much. The other reason is because the patriarch and matriarch, my grandparents, aren't able to manage the family like they did when I was younger. Last year, I attempted to put a plan in place to at least begin to rebuild the family. I suppose my long-term hope would be to eventually integrate family into my business dealings and also accomplish my goal of buying Genstar. That's my great-grandfather's, grandfather's, and uncle's generator and alternator shop. Now, I believe families as organizations are better fit to serve as the head of businesses because families can truly treat employees as, well, families. Also, family business can truly stand the test of time and create generational wealth. The reason I'm an advocate for generational wealth through family business is that if you can build a strong family vision that's long-standing, um, that generational wealth can be can do more good than, say, the corporations and even the government. Unfortunately, these stories are not usually discussed. We only hear about the greed of wealthy families, but not of their love for philanthropy or helping running governments and giving back to man and womankind. I came across some of these stories in my research on figuring out how to build my business and building it as a multi-generational family business. In my research, I learned that I don't really have a family. 
And that is what set me on my journey to reshape and relearn what family means and how it's important to me. Now, what I've learned so far is that there's a difference between what we call wealth families um, and regular families, and specifically the difference between how they teach their children. What I find more saddening is that non-wealthy families don't even have the ability to acquire the knowledge and the resources that are available to wealthy individuals. Now, there's a distinction between ultra high net worth and high net worth individuals. For the purpose of our conversation, we're going to lump them together. So traditionally, ultra high net worth is over 50 million in net worth, and high net worth is somewhere between 2.5 million and 2.9 million in net worth. So when I use wealth moving forward, I'm going to refer to net worth, or when I refer to net worth, that's going to mean 2.5 million and up. Now, let me give an example of this lack of resources problem. Now, I'm not in the camp of the net worth of over 2.5 million in net worth, but we do have the access to discretionary income that allows us to have um, resources such as a marriage counselor. I have my own counselor. My wife has a counselor. My niece has a counselor. And I'm an advocate for improving oneself, one's emotional intelligence, and one's communication skills. I'm also a fan of psychotherapy. But the point being is that having a therapist has helped my marriage. It has helped me with the added stress, and it helped has helped me with those things that I just mentioned, like improving myself, emotional intelligence, and my communication skills. Now, this is something that a lot of family business books talk about. They talk about having family communication specialists or counselors help mediate problems between family to help make them stronger for the family and for the business. This is something that I think that all families can benefit from, but families may not have the money or even the know-how on how to do this. Now, the example that I just gave is very basic, but we could think of other ones if needed. However, this isn't what I want to accomplish. What I want to accomplish is going over what to do. Um, I'm sorry. I want to go over what do wealthy really teach their kids that the non-wealthy people don't teach their kids. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because we mostly hear how they teach them about um, drivel, right? Um, the drivel that comes from financial gurus. Now, some of the stuff that they teach is accurate, but from my reading and research, it goes a little bit deeper. And that's what I want to talk about. So what do wealthy parents teach their kids? Well, the number one thing that you can imagine that they teach them is to buy assets. Now, that's something that the financial gurus talk about a lot, like Robert Kiyosaki and Anthony Robbins and so forth and so forth. I'm sure those names can go on. Susie, Susie Orman, I think, is another one. Um, and so, um, except um, Susie Orman has a really good talk show. I listen to it sometimes. I listen to her podcast. Now, that being said, they teach them to buy assets. Now, this should be no surprise, but they teach them that they should be spending their money on assets. This isn't just some of that drivel that I just mentioned earlier. This is how this is how this works. When you buy assets, you want to buy assets that generate income. This usually comes in the form of an operating business. Now, in my case, 3T Fitness, Age of Radio, and the Uncommon 1% are by operating businesses. Now, these are important for a couple of reasons. The income that is generated that you can pay yourself with, such as w, as a W-2 employee or through dividends and distributions, that's how you can live off of these while you're in your working life. The second reason is that, um, but then when you're outside of your working life, you still own those assets and you can still get those dividends and distributions. The second reason is that at some point you may decide to sell that company and sell off those assets. And that is when an equity event takes place. And, and you can make quite a bit of money from an equity event. And that's usually how people make their mass fortunes of money is because there was an equity event that took place. Now, if you're going to spend, say, $5,000 on a new 8K television, which is something that I want to do, it would be better to put that $5,000 into a side business, and then as that gets going, you can use the money that's generated from that business to buy the television, or the television, at least in my case. Now, I take my money from 3T, and I put it into growing Age of Radio. That's why I don't go out and buy the television, because the money that I get from 3T, I want to keep putting it into Age of Radio, so Age of Radio can continue to grow, and then at some point, that money from 3T will just continue to go for me, it won't go to Age of Radio, and the money from Age of Radio will also come to me, and that's how you start building an empire. Now, the second thing that they teach their children are financial statements. Wealthy families traditionally have businesses or run businesses because they're buying assets. Now, understanding financial statements is super important. This may not take place until teenage years or right after becoming an adult, but they want their children to understand the balance sheet. They want them to understand the income statement or the profit and loss statement. And they often, but super important, the statement of cash flows. Now, in wealthy families, this is usually taught during a family meeting or a family retreat. Now, if you're not familiar with the balance sheet shows, 
or if you're not familiar with the balance sheet, it shows all of your assets and your liabilities and your equity. And this is where the famous A equals L plus E formula comes from if you ever took a bookkeeping class or a beginning accounting class. Now, this shows how many assets the company has and what the debts the company has. Now, what is left over, if you subtract the assets, that's what the net worth, I'm sorry, if you subtract the liabilities from the assets, what's left over is the net worth of the company, and that's what's called the equity. Now, the income statement is the most popular because it shows profitability of a company, and this is sometimes referred to as a profit and loss statement. Now, net income equals revenue minus expenses. Pretty straightforward for the most part. Because you have the money coming in, that's your revenue, you have the money going out, that's your expenses, and what's left over is your net income, some of that goes to Uncle Sam, and then what's left over, you can save and push out as dividends. Now, with the balance sheet and the income statement, um, there are a lot of non-cash items that reduce and increase these accounts. And so you have another statement that's not talked about a lot, but it's the statement of cash flow. Now, this isn't to be confused with the statement uh, or the cash flow quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki. This is an actual accounting statement that's utilized. It's called the statement of cash flow. And it shows exact actually what happened with the cash during that period. And so it's like you have depreciated, uh, if you have depreciation, that's usually added back in. You could have some type of interest expense that may be back in. I haven't done it in a long time, but you could go look at a basic accounting book. It'll show you how the statement of cash flow works. I just print one out from um, QuickBooks. So uh, and then I, I know how to read it. That's that's the important part. Calculating it may not be so important. Making sure that you understand how to read it is super, super important. And so if you're going to have a business, you should take some time to really understand these. And then as your kids get older and you teach them about the business, you should educate your kids on these financial statements. The third thing that I find that they teach their children or a lot of them teach their children is long-term long -term planning. Wealthy families try to instill a sense of vision inside of their children. Uh, planning and organization are traditionally taught early on. Now, there's an important emphasis on visions or constitutions. Now, we all hear about visions and vision boards and personal mission statements. Well, these concepts carry over into other parts of their lives. So on the base of it, each individual person should have a personal mission statement that helps to guide a person through their life. However, you should be doing this not only as a family, but also for each role that you have within your life. This is something that wealthy families work to instill in their children in some fashion or other. This then can be implemented in any sort of way to create a purpose for everything that they do. So say a brother and sister might have a mission statement for their relationship, a husband and a wife, a group of cousins, a side business might have it, a main business, and this can go on and on and on. And not only does this help with each person's life and their relationships, it teaches the children this really early on. And when they become part of a family business or go out and become or start their own business or become part of another business, they have a better sense of how to create a mission or vision for whatever department that they're running or that they're a part of or a mission for what they're trying to accomplish within that area area of the business that they're a part of. The fourth one is not really talked about a lot. Um, I talk about it a lot, and the stuff that I look at talks about it a lot, but they teach them a lot about governance. Now, governance comes in a lot of different ways, but it manifests itself early on in these families. Now, in a family business where the family business grows, what usually happens is that whether or not owners are oper whether or not um, their owners are, are operators within the business, they usually sit on some type of board of directors. Now, being on a board requires the ability to create a vision and a strategic plan for the future of the business. And this is why the long-term planning is so important and the visions. Now, what also, what also happens is that as family businesses grow and owners have ownership as shareholders without being on a board or operator position, they need to understand the business. Now, families build these things called family councils to govern the family. The council will help with mend relation. The, the council helps like mend relationships, plan the education of the family, how to keep the family close, and so forth. And the goal is to help prepare the children for this role in their life. And, and because when they're young, they may have young councils, maybe manage a philanthropic effort, effort or have the cousins work to make sure they're building strong relations um, with each other. One interesting to note on this is, is that these things can be even beneficial for non-business owning families. Now, my thought is that if this was done in some capacity to manage the family as an organization, a lot more families would have side business or ventures that would help them build wealth um, over time. Um, it would also help with communication and build strong relationships. Now, education is planned and continued. 
And this is the other thing that a lot of families teach. Now, in our current society, we talk a lot about why kids shouldn't get an education, or maybe not a traditional education. My opinion is that everyone should go to college. It doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that you won't be wealthy or that you will be wealthy if you go to college. However, in wealthy families, especially in wealthy family businesses, education is administered and planned by the family council. It encompasses both higher education and continued learning. It is important that family members have the necessary education to run the business. Now, a lot of times MBAs or Masters in Business Administrations are required for higher managerial and executive positions. Another example is if the family owns an engineering company, then it will be a requirement to have an engineering degree for that family. And it may also be a requirement that they would need an engineering degree along with whatever area um, that family member might want to do with the business. So let's say the child would is wanting to go into the engineering family, but they want to work in marketing. The child would need an engineering degree so they understand the overall encompassing purpose of the business. And they would get, say, a marketing degree, right? Maybe the engineering degree is a bachelor's and their MBA is with an emphasis in marketing. Marketing. Now, if they want, um, and they usually require this if they want to work in the business in that department. So in this case, the marketing department. The other type of planning that takes place is continued education. Now, the family council will make sure that the shareholders are getting the proper education to sit on the board one day or to move into executive positions. So some wealth families even have a chief learning officer on staff for the family. And that person is specifically in there to help with that higher education and continued learning for all of the different cousins, nieces, nephews, uh, um, other people that are coming into the family business, right? Because it's a giant organization, but there's a family top. Now, families to th families that want to thrive for multiple generations require planning, and they're going to require a lot of education because that education and need is going to change over time, and that's why this is so important. Now, the sixth thing that I found that every family business or wealthy family teaches their children or wealthy family business owners teach their children is philanthropy. And this should be no surprise. This one's talked about a lot. Wealthy people tend to be the most philanthropic. Um, because of most of them, not the stuff that we always see on the TV, most of them are grateful for what they have and where they're at in their life, right? We don't see that, but that's traditionally what happens when you sit down and you have good conversations with them, like um, Dennis Jaffe does in some of his book, Borrowed From, uh, Borrowed From Your Grandparents or Borrowed From My Grandparents. Um, so if you go looking for these stories, you will find them. Now, wealthy families love to give to the things that they believe in, and this is what shapes the world. Now, unfortunately, this is what shapes the world. So if you want the, if you want to change the world, one of the best ways to do it is by building up a family business and getting large enough money so that then you can give the money to the things that you want to see change within the world, right? And wealthy families, they teach us to their children early on. Now, there are wonderful stories that you could find of wealthy families that have their children get a, uh, get a budget, and they work together to come to a conclusion on where to give that money. So they'll start a little young family council, maybe the 13-year-olds to 18-year-olds. They'll work together, research a uh, uh, uh nonprofit organizations, put some stuff together put their case to their parents, their parents or the the family count, the, the actual family council, not these young members, they'll decide on, uh, they'll say, yes, these ones sound good. We're on board with this. You guys get to choose. Um, or they'll have to explain to them why they're going to give this money to this film, uh, nonprofit. And um, that is a great way to not only give back to the community, but get cousins and brothers and sisters to work together in a business type fashion. Um, so there, if you go looking for these things in books, you will find them. Now, a lot of time we only think of wealthy families only teaching their kids about money. And as I've just mentioned, there are other things that they teach them besides money. And what I have personally experienced is, is that money itself isn't the important thing, right? Money isn't, isn't itself the important thing, but money is important because you use it to create good in the world. And that's why money is important. So the next time that you think that money doesn't matter or money's not important, take that thought out of your head. Because money is important because it is what we use to create the world that we want. We will talk at you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Age of Jeremy. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcatcher. If you can do me a favor, please rate this podcast if your podcatcher allows you to. Talk to you soon.
Okay, everybody, it's Michael E. Cullen II. And I'm Sesame Encarta from the All Too Real 2 podcast. We're passionate about movies, TV, and pretty much all things pop culture. Dive into the chaos of failed sitcoms, direct-to-video sequels, and the quirky realms of cinema and TV. Join us every Thursday for your dose of All Too Real 2 entertainment. We'll guide you through debates like whether Howard the Duck qualifies as a superhero. Ponder if Larry the Cable Guy could be the new rock or Schwarzenegger. Discover if some shows and movies should have stayed in the cutting room. Ever heard of a sitcom featuring that dictator with the funny mustache? Well, we watched it. We're dedicated to unraveling the peculiarities of pop culture, sometimes with awesome guests. So, if you're into the eccentric world of pop culture, listen and subscribe to All Too Real 2. Available wherever you find podcasts and on Age of Radio.